the thought of making define the great line after they're only chasing safety to people seems like a huge risk, but I don't think we ever consciously like said we were going to take some huge risk. I think we just kind of always followed our gut and didn't listen to what people wanted us to do. I don't know. Aaron, did you ever really feel pressure? Like, I, I didn't I, personally ever feel like they wanted us to do anything we didn't want to do except for. I mean, they did though. Like we're, we're such an insular group of people. Like, I don't know how to explain it. Like we are uh, like, we have like, we fight a lot still about this and we <laughs> on a regular basis, but we are so, um, we're so married to each other and our craft and that sounds so douchey, but I don't mean for it to like what we do is so important to us that we fight and end up hating each other half the time because of it. And if you remember like during their only chasing safety, they wanted to do radio edits. K rock at the time was like the tastemaker for, for radio. Like, like if you got on K rock, you could like every, every alternative station would follow suit. And this is when alternative radio wasn't hand claps and banjos. It was the used and, my chemical romance and story of the year and they're only chasing safety took off that summer the summer of 04 and they came to us and they were like we want to do a radio edit like k-rock will give you carte blanche drive time i remember that word drive time and we were like no you're not doing a radio edit i think if we would have done a radio edit of reinventing your exit and we would have made they're only chasing safety part two we would have been biggest band in the world for 25 minutes like i really think that I think it I think would have faded super fast. We wouldn't be sitting here today. We wouldn't be having this conversation. So I think that the risk we've taken is everything. We do whatever the hell we want. And I know that sounds cocky and I don't mean for it to, but we literally make the music we want to make every single time. And I think that a part of that comes from our upbringing. Most of us grew up really conservative, like, uh, it, it's spiritually conservative. Like, so Christian Holmes and Spencer didn't, but like, so you you get so married to doing things with integrity. So I think for us, like, we just had to make, we had to do what we wanted to do. Otherwise, it was a lie. You know what I mean? So like for us that grew up religious, it was like, you can't lie. So like, you have to do whatever you want to do. So you're not telling a lie. As soon as we all grew up and we all became men, it became more about like, this is just what we do. So in my opinion, everything has been a risk. Erase Me was a risk because we didn't make to find the great line part two because it would have sold and people would have loved it but i don't want to make the same record twice because it's a lie the early records on take hold for under oath um it was kind of like like the first one was called active depression and it was recorded at a studio in Tampa called Audio Lab. Tampa is like a big death metal scene. There's a bunch of death metal bands from there. So this studio, Audio Lab, was ran by this guy named Greg Marchek, who he's, he's passed away now, but he recorded the first ever Under Oath recorded music. Um, and before that, we had gone on tour um, in one van with nine people with a band called Sleeping by the Riverside, who was like a local band like we were. And we played at a place called Slacker 66 in Birmingham, Alabama, which was owned by a guy named Chad Johnson, who was doing like a, it was like a skate shop that he opened that sold records. This is like 99. Um, so those two things were like synonymous with one another, you know. Um, so he opened this skate shop and they sold records in the front and he was like funding some bands. Um, like just a few bands. There's a band called 238. He had... Um, I can't think of who else. I, man, I hate that I can't remember. That was literally 20-something years ago. So, uh, Anyways, he saw us play that night. And this band, Sleeping by the Riverside, had a deal with him. Um, so he saw us play that night and offered us a deal. Um, so he sent us to Audio Lab to make this record. So on the weekends, we would go to Audio Lab. And this is before like Pro Tools and Logic and all that stuff. So it was recorded to tape, and it was super expensive. So I think... If I can remember why, that's why we went only on the weekends. And then there was one after that called Cries of the Past that we we recorded in South Florida with James Wisner, who went on to do Changing of Times, and then our first like full-time band record, The Only Chasing Safety. And before Changing of Times, which is the one before Chasing Safety, we had just been really a local band, um, truthfully. Like, we had this little label that would help us make records, or these, e these two EPs that we never toured, really. Uh, I think we did two tours. Um, kind of just up the eastern seaboard 
um, when I wasn't in school. I was the baby. So, um, and then we recorded Changing of Times for Take Hold, um, and then Tooth and Nail purchased Take Hold Records, and I think they offered two bands record deals um, out of his roster. So one was a band called Two Thirty Eight, and they put out a record called You Should Be Living, um, and then one was our band, and we put out Changing of Times and. I think we did one or two tours off of it, and then uh, Spencer joined the band. Um, and that's when everything really started being like a full-time under oath of what you know it now. Dallas was the original guy in the band, him and a guy named Luke Morton, and then they called me. We asked Dallas to leave in 2002. He was going through a bunch of family stuff, and just um, we were like all in on the band and, and it wasn't that he wasn't all in on the band we were we did a few dates on warp tour in 2002 and he just had, was going through so much family stuff so we asked him to leave and then we were going to break up and for some reason that eludes me we didn't uh and then we asked Spencer to join the band and that's what everyone knows of under oath is from there forward so those formative years um i don't remember much about because it was sort of like a, you know it was your local band like i had like a the high school job and um and there was times that i really thought that we wouldn't do it anymore like just because like we all had to like live with our parents and work you know so after we asked dallas to leave it was more like let's put the pedal to the floor and do this you know um we had started to see some some traction at warp tour that year we did like four dates and then literally left because he was going through so much stuff. I mean, there's no bad blood there now. You know, in recent years, he's he had a massive ATV accident and almost lost his life. Um, so obviously, there's no bad blood with him. It just, you know, that's the that's the that's the inception of the band, which is weird to talk about because I don't really think of Under Oath as starting until like 2003 because it was such a, like a local band, like one or two tours here and there. Chase and Safety always gets pinned as like Spencer's first record new singer but it was a new half the, there's six guys on the roof and it was three new members 2002 and 2003 what under oath is now kind of became that spencer was the, just the last piece i feel like back then uh, a lot of people that maybe walk, like read ap now don't realize that before you had an iphone or a smartphone in your back pocket it, it like the only way to get your band out there was to tour nonstop. And that's why as younger bands, we kind of burnt through members. Like I was in a band. That's how I met the guys in Under Earth. Like we were touring, we were on a label called Face Down. I met Chris. We had played with Under Earth a couple of times. We would burn through members, Under Earth burning through members because not, no one could really handle the like, okay, you're in a band. If you want to go somewhere, if you were in the underground scene at all, you weren't signed by a major you know, by underground, I mean, any indie label, like you had to tour nonstop. I mean, it was like, you're not going to college. You're not going to have a job. You're only going to eat if you're on tour. And like a lot of kids just couldn't, you know, like you wanted to hold on to that car or that girlfriend or that apartment. It like, it wouldn't work for you. You know, like you had to literally go all in at like 17 or 18 or you weren't going to, I don't, you, were gonna cut through. you know, what's funny about that is like, that's that's true you know like that's what we did we were like okay like we're leaving home now like we literally just like it was wild like if i think about it now i have two kids and i'm like there is no way like in bloody hell i would let my kids do what we did like and i, I think you know because it was a different time maybe you know yeah. what i mean like we literally but he's right like unless you were on a major label like we didn't know any way to gain exposure other than to get in a van and play for 10 people. And then next time you get to town, there's 50 people. And then 10 times down the road, you know, people now they say like, look at all these people here. You guys are so lucky and we are lucky. But what people don't realize is we went to that city 400 times first and, yeah. it, grew, and it grew by 40 people every time until there's 5,000 people in LA. Oh. But there's 5,000 in LA because we played all the way from eight people to the 5,000 yeah. people. You know? And when I got, when I got in the van, there was many nights that we played for 15, 25 people playing on the floor, you know, like totally. once we got to the Southeast, outside of the Southeast, we were hitting places, a lot of places for the first time. I think even, you know, like 
there was a, maybe Florida and Alabama and Atlanta were, were pretty decent for under oath, but outside of that, we were like, it was brutal for a while, unless we were supporting someone that was substantially bigger than us, you know? Um, yeah, it was just touring nonstop. It was strange. It was strange because like back then it was strange because it didn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, it was the kind of thing, if you went and played a show for eight people, you're like, yeah, there'll be 20 people next time. It'll be awesome. You know what I mean? Like, it's so different than it is now. Like, like I said, you know, our first couple things we did were without computers. It was to tape, you know, like it was just different. Like you didn't expect instant gratification. You know what I mean? Like, like you do now, like you can, I mean, you literally put something online and three days later, it can be like, I love, there's a quote that Post Malone said. He's like, I literally put up White Iverson and went to bed and woke up famous. You know, like that didn't, yeah. that didn't exist. You played for 10 people and prayed to God there'd be a hundred in a year, you know? So, but I, you know, I wouldn't trade any of that. I think that the formative years of Under Oath and, and the, the nexus of Under Oath is, is such a cool story for me to think back on. And because now that we still have it, it's like a miracle. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I feel. Like, every day I wake up, and if I'm talking about Under Oath, I'm like, wow, we're, we really are, like, freaking lucky. Chasing Safety came out on Warped 04. We hadn't seen, like, financial success before then. And even that summer, we missed, what was it, three weeks of the tour, Speed? Something like that, because our vehicle kept breaking down. Like, oh, uh, on, on 04 Warp Tour? On 04 Warp Tour, that, Chasing Safety was becoming a success, and I don't think we even knew. Like, we knew because every day the shows were getting bigger, and at the end of the summer, Coheed and Cambria asked us to come on tour, and we literally went on that tour. They had two buses and a huge crew and a semi-truck, and we went on that tour in a van with 10 people. We did not know. <laughs> we didn't know. We didn't. We li literally didn't know that that their only chasing safety was big. Like, we didn't, I know that sounds so stupid, but we literally didn't know. I, I personally don't think we felt pressure going into the next record. Like, Not at all. I, I think, it, like Aaron said, like, we didn't know how big it was, and we, you know, we just started to, like, sell out our off day shows on Warp Tour, and then we did that Kogi thing, and we did some other stuff here and there, but, like, it, it wasn't like, oh, we're constantly selling out everything. We did our, our first headliner, right? It was totally radical. Oh, five. And, and, and that tour did really well, but we brought a bunch of bands we thought were really cool, and it was like a cool package in our opinion. And I, just, I still don't think we thought of ourselves as like a huge band that has to make this crazy follow up. We were just happy playing music, and I think unhappy with the last record sonically and we're like let's just go make something we really want to make and i think we went in with a good headspace of like excited because all the all the drama that i was talking about earlier with like us doing a radio edit that was all the very end of the chasing safety cycle so for us like we had already been we had already shifted gears mentally to like we're going to make a different record like way before all of that stuff started happening and again we didn't know that chasing safety was popular like, yeah. I, don't, I don't think it hit me that Under Oath was popular until 2006 when Define the Great Line came out and we're on Warp Tour and we get this phone call that it sold 100,000 copies in the first seven days. And every day there's thousands of people and we're like, what in the hell? Like, I don't think for me, I realized that Under Oath was popular until that. That was yeah. the point for me. Even yeah. though 05, like... We did a big tour, like our first show, the SWAT team showed up because there was 3,000 people in the street. Like, I think we thought that was because of the other bands, legitimately. I don't think that we, the six of us, like, still, we did, like we're still like, like that. The, those there's a lot of guys in the band that still view themselves. And like, I remember catching one of the guys in our band recently telling someone that we're, yeah, you know, we do like 500 tickets, which is totally not true. But, like, that's the kind of mentality that, like, it, we've always been, like, really weird about it, I think. Like, Under Earth got weird about, it. like, that success kind of, like, I think messed everyone's mind up because we didn't understand it, and it didn't make any sense to anyone. And I did, I remember when Define the Great Line came out and that phone call happened, I remember calling my older brother and, and asking him, is 100,000 records a lot? 
like I was just, I didn't know, like I, I was just like, I was a musician. I had no idea about the fucking business and numbers and like, that wasn't what I was interested in. So I remember calling my older brother, Phil, and be like, is a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand sales a lot? Cause people seem to be excited. Should I be excited? Like, I don't know. The shows are rad. And I think that's all we ever really focused on was, or the show's dope. Like, Dude, it's, show's still, it's still like that. Yeah. Like, we're still those people, which is like a blessing and a curse because we don't realize what we have. And then we do at the same time. We realize it's only about the people who listen to our music and who come to the shows. But that's all that matters to us. Like, I've seen everybody in the band play a show throwing up in a bucket because that's all that matters to us is getting through the shows. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Like mentally, I think that we all, we're a, we're a weird bunch of people, man. After chasing safety, we, we were, we had this conversation. It's like, we sounded pretty violent live. Like it, we were, we didn't play to a click track back then. We were really young, really excited. And it was way more violent live and, than it was and that's that record came out super polished and i remember that was uh for a lot of the members of the band very unsettling we were very unhappy uh, after a little while being like it just didn't seem like us and i think that's where the big shift was with the find the great line is that we had this product and that we were touring on we, we, and back then it was like well you know i always remember that thinking that people saw us live first Cause that's how it was back then you used to go to shows in the opening bands you would see for the first time and you yeah. buy the record because there wasn't spotify and instagram and all this other stuff you just that's how you found out about bands you went you buy a ticket to see the headliner it was 10 bucks and the opening band players you thought they were cool you pick up their cd at the merch table and that's kind of we always you know we were playing first and then people would hear our record they back then they weren't hearing they're only chasing safety before they were seeing us live. That was the decision we made. That we wanted to, we wanted our records to sound like we're live, and that's where "Define the Great Line" came in. Is uh, sounding so different to the outside world is because we just wanted to feel the way we felt on stage, and we were trying to capture that better. In separation, there was huge rifts in the band, which I didn't really remember too too much until we did that stream not too long ago when Matt Goldman was talking about it. I think we were all on separate pages which is which is terrifying to it was terrifying but if you think about it you know you put a bunch of kids in a van you it's like i always explain it like okay you're in a van all the time you know 11 months 10 months out of the year whatever cd goes in the cd player you know this is before everyone's listening to their own shit on their iBuds or whatever you know like we're all listening to the same record all the time. We pull over at the same exit to eat every meal. You know, there's a band unit doing everything. And then as it kind of progresses and then there's a bus and then there's some success and people start eating different places and dressing different and listening to some different music because you're not stuck in a van all the time. I think we all started to find our individualities if you met Under Oath in 03, 04, 05, we were one person. <laughs> like, we all looked and acted and talked the same jokes, watched the same movies, listened to the same exact records. And then as success happens, there's more space to become a human and an individual, which I think is good. But I think for the band, it seemed really dangerous and unhealthy. Like, oh, look at him. He's off wearing some weird shit and eating someplace by himself or with some friends he met in Atlanta last time or he's not hanging out with us anymore. Now that guy's not hanging out with us or they're a little click. And I think we just ne didn't know how to talk about it. And, it. and now it's made it a beautiful thing where we're all individuals that can coexist. But at the first breaking of like, you know, you gotta remember it, it at, at the beginning we were a Christian band too. So you're putting all this outside weight on not only do we need to make the same music and get along we also have to believe the same things and if you start to believe something different if you talk about it we're going to kick you out of the band because if you don't believe it you can't beat the band so there's a lot of different strings being pulled on you uh, emotionally i felt like and as we start to become individuals it just made a lot of weird tension and i think people were upset 
and with each other and didn't know how to talk about it. And I think that going into loss and sound separation and, you know, there's some people not believing anymore already. Uh, and there's other people like myself who was using substances to escape from all the weirdness. And then there's other people eating out of trash cans and going on Bible walks during the day and not showing up to the show. You know, it was fucking weird. And I think we went to that record angry. I've been trying to wrap my brain around Lost in the Sound of Separation just because I don't remember the lyrics or we only play a few of those songs and listening to the whole thing and like kind of sitting behind a drum set and relearning the songs, you can hear like it's the most, it's the most tense piece of Under Oath music. You can really hear it like it's, it's, it's dark in a lot of ways, you know, just because it's it's everything pulling against each other, which I th is what I think makes it cool. Um, but it's it's uh, it sucked to make for me, you know, because I wanted one thing, I wanted one thing, and Spencer wanted another thing. We had we had to agree to a certain extent because we write all the lyrics together, so we found common ground. Spencer's on drugs at this point. Like my anxiety's through the roof. The rest of the band, it's like it's like them versus uh, him and I. And the, I, yeah, I mean, it was just listening to that thing. Now it's like, damn, like how did we even get to this place? I love that record, but Me it too. was it was a really scary time, a really dark time. Um, and I don't think just for me and Aaron, I think we get pinned on a lot because Aaron had a lot of anxiety, hypochondria issues, and I was on drugs. But I think the other guys, some of the other guys who were dangerously on the opposite end of things. Um, it, it just, it was just really uh, unloving time for all of us. I think we all were just completely disjointed, but somehow came together to make music. It was brutal in, until we were like working on a song and then we would, we would, agree and get stoked on music and that was what was really holding the band together is like pushing the playback and seeing all six dudes be like oh, like this is so sick like we did it again like we made another fucking sick song and like um and that was what all we had at that point i think was the music we didn't have a friendship or a family vibe at all anymore uh, we just had the songs and that and there is a lot of anger and sadness and darkness in the lyrical content. And I think even in the guitar playing, you can hear the emotion of what some people were going through and stuff. It was, it was a pretty fucked up time. Survive Kaleidoscope's a live thing that we shot at the Electric Factory. I don't remember why we did it. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't, I think it's just something we made. I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen it. Uh, yeah, I, that was a weird time. I was on my way out. Um, then, you know, I was so unhappy then. Um, that was one of my last tours before I left the band in 2009 or 2010. So I think that was my last U.S. That was my last U.S. tour. And I was pretty like, man, I was pretty one foot out the door by then. You know, I still loved playing, but I just, I don't know. Like I just socially within the band, I hated, hated it. I hated myself. Uh, I dealt with generalized anxiety disorder so bad. I needed to be medicated and wouldn't do it. Like I, there were some days I went to the hospital like five times. Like it was, just, I was just fucking miserable. So I just wanted out. It was, it was Europe on that tour when. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So during that touring cycle in Europe, so I, it might have been. It wasn't very long after Survive Kaleidoscope. I don't think I literally just. It's like I'm out. You know, the guy sat me down, and I felt like I was ganged up against. They were, it was brutal. It was it was a brutal time. I you know it was anxiety is one of those things that's like hard for people to understand that don't deal with it. I guess it's also a, it's like a self isolating disease where you it's you become really selfish. And the guys explained to me how selfish I was, and I took that as like a giant attack instead of like a hey man like you're being a butthole like get this taken care of. Like I took it as like oh they don't care that I got something going on with me so fuck them. So. I just left. I don't remember. I don't remember why, other than that, you know, that I just. I think, I, and I think going back to the, the last thing, like I had gone through something similar. I got kicked out of the band in 2006, and then there was a lot of anger I had held, and 
in resentment towards those dudes. And then it happened, it kind of happened something similar, but we didn't kick Aaron out. We, we had a conversation with Aaron in 2009. So in 06, the conversation ended with us going home from warp tour and I was kicked out of the band for a couple of months. And then 09, it kind of was like a sit down with Aaron. And I think the sit downs with the earth never really go very well. Um, especially when religion is involved and brought into it. It's just like, it, it just doesn't feel like a very helpful element to any sort of conversation when you're trying to help someone get through something. And I think with Aaron, it was kind of at that point after the 06 thing, it was kind of like, it was me and Aaron. And then after, by the time we got to 09, after the sit down with, with, with Aaron, Aaron was just like, look, it's kind of me and you versus them and I'm not doing this anymore. And I remember that show. I'll never forget that show. Mm-hmm. When, in, yeah. In Czech Republic. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, there's a couple of songs I play guitar on and it's actually that guitar right there that has still made it. I mean, that guitar's made it on so many albums as a rhythm guitar. Cause it sounds so good. It's not even that nice of a guitar. But that guitar, I was playing it um, on emergency broadcast or casting such a thin shadow. One of those songs at that time, uh, and I threw it all, I threw it to the second story balcony and landed on the floor and then threw it through his kick drum. And it still makes it on reference today. Somehow it survived my anger with Aaron. And I'll, I'll never forget, because, you know, me and Aaron have been best friends since I was probably 17 years old. And I just felt, I remember that at that point, I felt like I was like, well, fuck, now I'm alone, you know, in this. And it should never feel like, you know, so compartmentalized in the North, but I think we just didn't stop long enough to breathe to make any sort of sense out of why things have gotten so, you know, in these little compartments of clicks and stuff. Um, yeah. And that was... That time was bad, man. And I, when you when you say survive kaleidoscope, that's what I think about. It's like that was the last U.S. tour I did before I left. So I think about all that dysfunction. So for me, maybe that's why I erased it from my memory that it exists for some reason. Like, I, like when you even asked, I was like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> so I think that's probably why is because as you just heard the saga, it was just such an emotional time. You know, Spencer was so on drugs, I was so miserable, and I don't even know. <sighs> You know, like we just have this thing keeping us together that's the music that we make, and I don't even know how we made it that far. I think disambiguation is, I get a lot of stuff from fans now that we're so connected with our fans, especially during quarantine and stuff. And a lot of people love that record that I think that was a re- even weirder time doing disambiguation. And I, I wasn't happy to be in a band without my best friend anymore, but I tried to make the best out of it. And um, it was hard. It was a hard record to make. And that was probably the, the deepest of drugs I'd been into. Like I was using drugs all the time. And I think that's why I kind of roll my eyes sometimes at that time period. Cause I was like, man, I was like, like it was pretty brutal. Um, I guess it got a little bit more brutal after that, but that record was a tough one to make because it was, I, I was alone, you know, in the sense like I wanted to take things. If you hear songs like Paper Long and incompletion like I was trying to kind of like shift to like a heavier deft tones melodic way of keeping things heavy without being like hey we're pop punk you know like chasing safety was like the melodic side of that never I was never attracted to that I was always attracted to like the perfect circle and deft tones kind of like dark melodic side of things and then the other guys would come in and <laughs> I would record there was times I would record six different choruses and they, you know, guys that didn't even pick, like write a riff would come in and go, hate it, sucks, hate it, hate it. And then too catchy, too catchy. And there was this really weird thing on that record was too catchy. So I had to deconstruct all my good ideas to be less good in, oh, in my I brain. Never, I would have never made it, dude. I would have, I would have fucking killed everything. I don't know how, I, yeah, I yeah. can't. The producer, was like I don't know if he's produced anything since because I think that might have killed him <laughs> like 
I remember him coming in and those guys maybe delete something and the producer goes, well, you just deleted the catchiest thing on your entire discography. Like he was like, okay, here we go. You know, and I think we were just in a weird, everyone was in a weird spot and there was a different guy playing drums, Daniel, who was from Norma Jean, and he hadn't even really officially joined the band yet. He was just making the records and so he didn't really, I think ever really put his foot down on what he wanted. He was just kind of like skating in the middle, you know, of like what Spencer wants, what Tim wants. Like, what are we going to do here? You know, and I, um, but when I did, when we went back and listened to it the other day, I was like, I'm really proud of that record. I think it's, it's a little too heavy for my tasting, but like the melodic stuff on that record and, the, and there's some stuff on that record I really love. There's only a song or two I'm really like disgusted by, but other than that, like, Thing is pretty fucking cool. I like, like than, I like it more than chasing safety. Yeah, same. I'm not even. I'm not, I wasn't even there. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I. I mean, dude, like, I really like that record. My, you know what I think about when I think about disambiguation, is I had gone off to make solo music, I had quit, and I remember I, my solo stuff was on Tooth and Nail, so I was in their studio making the album, a solo album, when disambiguation was finished and I got to hear it first with Aaron Sprinkle and Brandon Ebel and I remember going this is dope this is shit like this is so cool and then <laughs> Spencer called me and he goes he goes why did you make me do that like without you like that was the hardest thing I've ever done I'll never forget that phone call it was like I had a Corolla Razor um, and that's what I remember about disambiguation is that phone call you going that was so difficult. And then me being like, damn, dude, like he he really did it by himself. You know, he did all the, wrote all the lyrics and sang and screamed and did it all. And then I, you know, then he went on to tell me that it was a living hell. Um, it was, it, it was fun. Like the, the things that, I, you know, I found ways to make it fun. I was kind of alone the whole time. Like I mentioned, like, um, I had friends in Atlanta though, you know, like the Mastodon guys were good friends of mine and I had other people I was surrounding myself with when it wasn't the studio, but I had a, a fun time. It was the first record Matt Goldman had had this other studio upstairs and I got to sing like all day. Like I would write, they would be working on something and I'd get like kind of the pre-pro, you know, scratch guitars to the drums and I would go up and like start singing and creating these songs that I knew most of it was going to get cut because uh, they wanted it to be heavier than that. But I would go up there and create all this stuff by myself. And then when they were done, I'd come down to the B room because they had A, B, and C room at the time, which is the only time we ever went there that it had that. And I went down to the B room and then we would just track. I mean, I would I would wake up in the late afternoon because I'd kind of party all the night by myself. But I'd wake up in the afternoon and literally sing and from four, I would start singing at like from four in the afternoon until about three in the morning, you know, every day. And it was, it was cool. That's what was cool about it. It's like, you were, getting, living, you were living hard then. Yeah, I was dying. I was like hung over to the moon and back every day. But I would I can't I, imagine starting anything at four o'clock. <laughs> well, I, mean, yeah. I, would, I would get up and eat and, you know, do other things and then start tracking around four. It's not like oh. I got up at four. Your hung, your hangover probably ended at three, so that you could start, you could start yeah. singing four. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, I'm nauseous. Or you'd, have, or I'm, you'd, have to, you'd have to take a sip of, of some, you know, something before you start. I'm tracking. nauseous <laughs> hearing. <laughs> I'm nauseous now hearing about that. Like, yeah. oh, I got up at seven a.m. today. I went to bed at three. I have a three week old baby, so. No, I but that was the, 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 the thing that made that record hell is that I think everyone wanted something different again and there was even less communication. I would work super hard and then people would just come and go, no, it's too catchy. Because we're in completely different rooms where I would just track like six different versions of the songs. Like, y'all fucking pick one. I love them all. And then I'd just bounce. <laughs> just like, like I'm, leave, I'm out. I've, I've done my work for today. Pick one, you know. Um, but looking back on the record now, uh, I enjoy it more now than I ever have, I think. It was 12 shows, and I was so fucking pissed. And I think Grant was super pissed. I was pissed, too, because I was like, yo, I remember I wasn't in the band, and I literally wrote them. I wrote everyone in the band. I was like, I'll come out. Let me play these last 12 shows to have closure on my band. Like, 
I think it's dumb you're doing 12 shows, but I want to at least play them because I have no closure. And they were like, nope, we're going to stick with our new drummer for our farewell, farewell tour. Oh, it made me so fucking angry. I was like, what? Like, they were out there playing, like, you know, all these songs we wrote together and saying goodbye to thousands of people. And they were like, yeah, we're going to stick with this guy that's been in the band for 20 minutes. Oh, I was mad, dude. I was so mad. I get it now. Like, why? It was you know, three years of touring nonstop. Three non years of touring yeah. nonstop. He was in the band. But, like, in my brain, that's what I'm saying. That's what I thought. I was like, this yeah. is fucked up. Like, so I was just so – you guys were pissed because it was 12 shows. And I was pissed because I – I got to play two songs at the very last show in front of our hometown crowd, which I'm super thankful for. It was a beautiful thing. Um, but, yeah, dude, I was madder than a hornet. I, I, yeah, I was very upset because I don't think um, – it's like the – it's like it's like that old saying, like, you know, if you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen kind of a thing. Like, I think the bands I look up to the most – have very long interesting careers of music that's shifting and changing and ups and downs and i think we were burnt out and having a bit of a down and not um necessarily seeing eye to eye but i think giving up is such like to say that it's over i still to this day disagree with it because clearly we're back together and we're playing i think taking a break or a hiatus makes sense and you know, we don't know if we'll ever play again. We, you know, like Nine Inch Nails has done it and Incubus has done tons of bands have done that, you know, like, but we were making such an affirm, like, this is the end, under, does not exist anymore. We're never going to play again. Like, and those dudes, the guys that were on that page, it wasn't bullshit. They weren't doing this for money to blow it up and then come back to it. Like, there was no plan of this ever happening again. Like those dudes were like, we're never gonna play again. And I would fight with them that, why would we not wanna play songs that people love ever again? Like what about 10 years from now, five years from now? Like these songs we worked so hard on, it's made our life. You're never gonna play In Regards to Myself again. You can't play it with other people. Like you're not gonna go start another band and play your old songs that you do with another band. I was like, this is so fucking stupid. Why do we throw our lives away, quote unquote, like not getting real jobs and going to college or whatever people are supposed to do like to say we're never gonna do this again and i was fucking pissed and like it it took me years to get over that to the point to where when the re rebirth conversation came up i had to call my manager because i was doing a duo project with my friend steven and it was called sleepwave and i called my manager his name was andy snape still a good buddy of mine. I called him and I was like, I don't know, man. Like he convinced me to do it. Cause I was like, even though I was the last man standing, I was like, why am I gonna, why am I gonna, I have to clear out this block of time when I'm working my ass off. Like, you know, I was in the studio every day. I was meeting with different record labels. I was touring nonstop. I was like, wait, so I gotta put this block on this stuff. Cause these guys wanna play some shows, but not get back together. We're just gonna go play some shows and make money. This isn't about money. I was like, fuck that. And, and it was Andy Snape who was like, he's a British dude, he goes, mate, I think you should do it. He's like, it's, it'll bring at least you some closure. And, and, you know, maybe you guys can talk about things, you know, fix things. And sure enough, you know, that Rebirth Tour did lead to us getting back together and making more music. But at the time there was no plan. Like, uh, we, we were gonna do a tour and that was it. It wasn't gonna go to Europe, it wasn't gonna go to Australia. And we fit that tour playing two hours a night, six days a week, which for a singer is career suicide because you can't sing two hours a night, six days a week on the road with catching different colds and different things. Like it was fucking nuts. And the reason why we did it in that short of a time is because Chris and Tim and James had to go back to work at their normal job. So we fit a tour into, you know, a tour that would have taken two months into one month time. They took all their time off and Clearly, we had a good enough time to where we got the band back together. But at, at that first phone call, I was like, man, I don't know. You know, like, as much as I, I never wanted the band to break up, I was like, kind of pissed off at even the fact that this was a conversation at the time. I was all about it because I, I needed to, like, put a bow on that chapter of my life where I thought that's what we were doing, you know, because the whole plan was rebirth. It, was like, it wasn't even a month. It was, like, a little over three weeks. and. To me, that was gonna be like the 
you know, that was going to be the time stamp. You know, go out with my guys, and then we just never stopped. It was like going on a date with someone, and they ended up, they ended up marrying them. That, that's what it literally was, was like. Like, we did that tour and just never stopped, and here we are four years later. In 2009, we decided we weren't going to be a Christian band, and because Daniel was an atheist when he came into the band, and then Grant admitted that he had been feeling that way for many years. I just don't think that people wanted to hear us when we would talk about it. There wasn't a whole lot of press around it or anything, you know? And I, then I think with Erase Me and having the first cuss word on it or whatever uh, is what raised all these eyebrows. And I, and I think releasing this stress that we all have to be the same is like the most beautiful thing you can do for any friend that you care about. Like, I just think it's super unfair whether you're standing here as a Christian today or not, if your values have changed at all or a little bit or a ton. It shouldn't matter. We shouldn't have, we are not the same people. We're going to go through different battles. We should be able to communicate and talk about things that we maybe don't have to completely agree on, but we can communicate as smart adults that have, you know, have open minds. And I think it was a beautiful thing to let people be as open-minded as they want to be. Um, and I think that's what allowed Under Oath to be Under Oath again. I don't think it could have existed in any other way. I think it's okay to say, it's okay to say, like, I believe in this, I believe in that. You're allowed to have beliefs, but I think that certain things shouldn't have a belief connected to it. And I think that, like, like, like you go to In-N-Out and you don't go, like, I'll have, like, an atheist, atheist burger, um, with, yeah. no, with no cheese. I think music is... Just, yeah. Our, lyric, our yeah. lyrics were worship lyrics. We never had a single song about our religious stance. I, I mean, they, you know, we use the word God just like you go, oh my God, but we've never written songs about Jesus Christ and Christianity. I think music is, uh, music is, is like that though. I don't think that it's safe or fair for music to be, like, have a creed connected to it. Because then, it's all, then it belongs to one group of people. And I think that the most dangerous thing with any art is exclusion. You know, with any art that you want people to listen to, like, when you, once you exclude a group of people, if you go, this is a Christian song, you've excluded, like, a vast number of people that don't believe in that creed. You know what I mean? Um, so for me, I just think that when you remove that, you get freedom with yourself. This is for, this is for us, and I, I'm not speaking for anybody else who plays in a Christian band or whatever, but, like, you get freedom with your friends, and then you get freedom to make something that's really, really, really honest, you know? And for us, we always did that, but I think that a group of people were excluded by us saying we're a Christian band. You know, I think there's a group of people well, I, that think... And I think that it, it, was, it was hard for the members, you know? It was a lot. It was a lot of weight for me to bear. It was a lot of weight for uh, other guys in the band, you know, that weren't feeling that way. You know, I think it would have saved us a lot of grief if we could have talked about our feelings. It was super weird for a long time to be able to talk about yeah. maybe not believing the same things. And there was, it wasn't, it was like an unspoken rule. It's like, you can't really say that. You, you'll probably get kicked out and fuck. Yeah. You got kicked out. Like it was, it was crazy. Like how quick things would shift with uh, those conversations. And I think just lifting that was just like, we could still all believe exactly what we want that we did the day one, but just lifting that was like, okay, now we can talk. It felt like, okay, now you want to be real? All right, let's be real. We don't have to pretend anymore and like, and walk around eggshells around each other. It's like everyone has their demons and everyone has their issues and everyone has good days and bad days or good years and bad years. And like not being able to talk to that, as a group of friends, it's fucking dangerous. I think both, and both I'm both surprised. Beliefs and religion are two different things. Like, I have beliefs in things, you know, but be to become religious about something, those two aren't the same thing. And people often equate those two phrases with the same thing. But religion is, is a set of rules that people make up, you know. Like, a belief is, is what you believe in and, and – you apply that to yourself. But religion is something that a group of people make up in order to carry their belief. Um, that's my opinion. And I think that when you're religious, like you kind of paint the armor on of your belief 
instead of allowing your belief to radiate out and other people's beliefs to come in so you can have an open dialogue. When you put on religion, you put on a set of armor that protects you, but it also keeps you from sharing anything too. So I think that a lot of us still have beliefs, but I, I don't think any of us are religious anymore. And I think that that's trying to differentiate the two is like, it's like splitting an atom, you know, it's super difficult to do, but I think that that's what we've been able to do in the last few years is look at ourselves and go, I don't really think any of us are religious. Some of us have beliefs, some of us don't. And we can talk about our beliefs and we can talk about our non-beliefs, but once you put it under the, the the moniker of religion is when it becomes a suit of armor that everybody has to wear. And I'm not interested in wearing any armor. I still look back at Erase Me and, and before COVID, like sometimes in the gym, I'll, I would just put it on just rent, like after it had been out for a while, I'm like, man, and it, well, I would text Aaron, I'm like, dude, this room is still fucking rips. Like, I'm really proud of what we did. And I'm excited to see what we do next. That's the conversation we always have is because we don't really know what will happen next with Under Oath because it's some weird thing with like, it will never sound like Under Oath if it was just me or if it was just Aaron or if it was just Tim or if it was just Chris. But like when you get the four of us in a room working on a riff, it makes it whatever that it is. And it's always kind of evolving and I'm excited to see what happens next. Every record is just where we were at that particular time. <laughs> I think it's fundamentally wrong. Like for our band, I'm not saying for everyone, you know, cause I write pop songs for a living, like when I'm home. I, I think it's fundamentally wrong for us to make music that we don't agree with at the time, all of us. And that's a, that's a big ask of each other. And that's a big ask of our fan base, but we've been so lucky that people have come along with us. You know what I mean? Like there's people that I talk to on a regular basis. They're like, I bought Chasing Safety when I was 12. Um, and I've purchased every record and I'm thankful for you guys. And that to me is like, that's what really matters to me. That's the proof, you know, that we have grown. It's just such a douchey thing to say too, but we have grown with our people. And I know it sounds douchey, but I mean it. Like we're lucky like that, you know, we don't sell out Madison Square Garden and we haven't been number one at radio and all of this stuff, but we have, we, we're lucky to have this long career. And I think it's because we do exactly what we feel we should. And somehow there's some symbiosis and synergy with our fans that they grow with that. Um, I also think people can see and hear honesty. I think- Totally, I agree with that. I think when you're making a record that you're not happy with, you can hear it in the performance. I, I don't think you know that's what you're hearing, but I think that's why some records you hear and you're like, oh, it's all right. I don't, and I think that's because the people that are doing it aren't sold on it. If you're not sold on what you're doing, how are you supposed to sell it on to someone else? And if you don't believe it, then like, what are you doing? You know, then you're just putting out a product. It's like, you might as well just be printing a t-shirt and going in, you know what I mean? Like, I think that's why Under Oath, every record has, has got its own identity is because we're gonna do, as far as heavy music goes, like Aaron said, like me and him both make tons of different types of music for a living when we're, it's not Under Oath, but when it comes to being, in an aggressive band, we're going to do that for Under Oath and it's always going to be what we want to do at that time as the, there's like four main writers in Under Oath that when we're all clicking on the same page or completely different pages, whatever that sound is, when we're all happy with it, that's what it's going to be. Otherwise, we're not putting it out. And um, I think that's what, you know, that's what makes it what it is. We, we just, it, it's the honesty because otherwise we're just, faking it you know like we could go try to make define the great line part two but we would be miserable and you'd hear it in the record and i don't think anyone would like it also you get you get into music so you don't have to have a like a real job and i think that like if you sit down and go okay you know this record sold x amount of copies and got this much traction so we need to make it again like that's a job at that point you know that's like saying like uh, I gotta mow this other lawn just like I did that one so it looks the same so my customers are happy. Like, I, I know, I'm not in that business, you know? I'm in the business of making something that's vital and, and real, you know? And if people like it, that's so, we're so lucky that people like it is what I'm trying to say. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we're lucky. We're freaking lucky that people care because there's so many good musicians and artists that make stuff that really matters. It's awesome that people don't listen to. So 
I don't know why at the end of the day people have stayed with us for so long and they like our band. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I'm thankful. We got to do what we wanted to do and we did it our way. We didn't listen to anyone and that showed us the world. And just being able to perform one show is like, getting able to perform shows around the world has just been like, I couldn't think of a better way to spend my life. And, I, and I'm like, like, I'm happy. We are happy now. That's fine. If we went through some times that publicly in front of people that was like, not stuff that you're really super proud about, but like, we went through some rough times, but I'm, I'm glad that we got around it. We got through it and here we are and we're happy. And I feel like it's, that's not, that's awesome. That's all I could ever, ever hope for. I don't think we'll ever do like a, we're breaking up. I just think we'll stop and then we'll do like more music 10 years later or something. I don't, I mean, I, my, my thing is like, we did it our way, you know, and not to sound cocky, but like we didn't give in with our band at all not one time never we and never we, did yeah i think the, the dream was always to play in front of people and my as a kid i always was like if i could hear anyone singing in my lyrics back to me that would be a success and i think the fact that i have seen the entire world and having people sing words back to me is like that's enough it's enough like the, this band has taken me around the world like i got to see earth you know, like, and with my friends and doing something that I love, playing music. It's like a huge outlet, not just like, like music, like aggressive music, like to where you get to release everything in your body that you want. And, and I think it that's the most fun thing. Even when Under Oath is not getting along and we have hated each other at times on stage, it was always a blast. And I think that's the biggest takeaway is that it's the most fun thing in the world is to get up on that stage. And which is ironic because right now we can't do that, <laughs> but because of COVID. But getting up onto that stage in front of five people at the beginning, all the way to headlining the last headliner we did with the Yingling Center, which was like seven thousand people, didn't matter. It was playing in front of people around the world. It's been everything with my homies, even yeah. when we hated each other. That's enough. That's enough. I think that like finally being able to say that's enough is a good feeling, you know, because. When you start out, you're like, I just want to play one show. And then you play the show. I just want to play one show where there's some people. I just want to make one recorded song. I just want to make one album. I just want people to sing one set of lyrics. And you keep upping it, upping it, upping it, upping it, upping it. And, you know, to finally, and, you know, I'll be 37 next week. And I was thinking about this this morning. Like, I'm happy. You know, like, I'm happy. Like, we're never going to be as big as my chemical romance or some of our peers and that's okay you know like we're never in like, but we we did things the way that we wanted to do them and it was dysfunctional at times and fucking miserable at times um but but overall like people are saying things that we wrote down back to us and we've seen the world and i i i'm i'm good with that you know i'm good with that <laughs>